Guys, welcome to our second, third talk, my second talk, the third talk on Living Seeds Farm today. Um, today we're talking about winter soil improvement and um, how to get started for winter, what to plant for winter. So the biggest thing with, with people that have vegetable gardens is that their summer vegetable garden is this awesome, stunning, productive vegetable garden. And their winter vegetable garden is like, I've got some cabbages and some broccoli, but they're not doing well. Am I right? Correct. And I think that's the biggest problem. And, and uh, it's a case of people, people don't plan to have a good winter garden. And if you plan to have a good winter garden, you have a stunning winter vegetable garden. So we've already started planting and planning for our winter vegetable garden. Our first batch of, of, of brassica seedlings are up there, about this size now. Um, and we will start, as this vegetable garden, this show garden over here, what this show garden does. So let me tell you about the show garden. So the show garden is for you guys to walk into the show garden and taste veggies. Okay, and it gives me so much joy when people bite into a tomato and go, but my mind is blown with this tomato flavor. Okay, or they go and they taste all of the different kinds of basil, or they taste all the different kinds of lettuce. And they actually get to experience all of these amazing varieties that we're growing. And the exact same thing happens in winter. Okay, we, so this vegetable garden is for you guys to enjoy, to go and literally to go and taste veggies. It also feeds our staff. We have 25 staff members on this, on this farm. And every single staff member can leave home every single day with fresh vegetables in their hands. Okay, so it helps our staff as well. But it also ensures that we keep taking product off the show garden. Because if you don't harvest off the plants, the plants are going to get to a point where they've produced their, their seed requirement for the season and the plant just dies. If you keep harvesting off the plants, the plants continue to produce. Um, those of you that have been into the show garden, if you go and look at the beans, we've got the first three rows on this side over here where we've replanted Vitsa beans. Um, and the reason why we've replanted Vitsa beans is because they are the best freezing bean and I want a lot of green beans over winter for our stews and curries. Okay, but all of the other bean plants are bean plants that were planted. If you look at the date on the, on the planting marker, those bean plants have been producing the whole of summer. And what they've done is they've removed every single pod, every single bean off those plants. And if you look at those bean plants, they're starting to actually go back into active growth again. And they will produce another crop of green beans. Okay, so it's, it's a case of you need to constantly be picking off, off, your, um, off your vegetable garden. However, when it gets to this time of the year, there are certain crops that go akasmuk. Okay, I'm going to die. And you know what? Don't try and pamper it and please, you know, give me an extra. Take the plant out and plant something else inside there. If you don't have seedlings now busy growing, when you pull those plants out, you're not going to be able to plant something in there. Okay, and it's a case of now is the time to be planting. So what you do, and, and this is what we do over here. I think we've got about 15 or 16 different kinds of cabbages. We will plant 50 of each cabbage variety into our show garden. Those of, who was here last winter? A couple of guys were here last winter. Did you see the cabbages in, at the far side over there? We had a couple of hundred cabbage plants. We planted cabbage once on one day. Our staff ate cabbage for four months of one planting. Okay, and the reason why they did that was because every single cabbage variety. Now, <clears throat> is there a commercial farmer here? Are there any commercial farmers? Okay, so commercial farmers, what the commercial farmer wants to do is he wants to plant one field of cabbage. And he wants to send his team of pickers into that field on one day, take all of those cabbages, load them onto a truck, and take it to the market. If he puts that truck into that field every single week to harvest this little bit over here and that little bit over there, and that, that impaction, the soil impaction of the truck going into, into his field destroys his soil. 
His labor cost increases because now he's now working that field five, six, seven, eight, ten times. Okay. And his losses actually increase because you will lose product every time you put people into a field. Somebody will damage something. That's the way it works. For the home gardener, what you want to do is you want to plant, well, some people want to plant seed every single week. I'm not one of those people. Okay, I like to plant seed once and reap the rewards of that planting for months. That's what I like to do. I'm a lazy, I am a lazy gardener. Okay, but you're a lazy gardener if you work smart. Well, you're a smart gardener if you work lazy smart. <laughs> okay, so if you look at cabbage varieties, we've got cabbage varieties that are mature in 45 days, 65 days, 75 days, 85 days. Let's wait until the helicopter goes over. But we've got cabbage varieties that mature, that that go all the way up to 120, 130 days maturity. How many months is 120 days? <laughs> Four months. Four months. Okay, 45 days is one and a half months. If you plant all of those cabbages on the same day, you will eat cabbage for close to five months. And I say 120 days is, is four months. But where does the five months come in? So when I say that a crop will be mature in 100 days, it's not going to, they're not all 50 plants are mature on day 100. Mm -hmm. Some will start maturing at day 85. Some will start maturing at day 110. Mm -hmm. There's this window that you can work with. And that is why heirloom seed, the seed that we sell in our store is so much better. Because there's always a window. Looking at a hybrid, at a hybrid seed, a hybrid seed, it's, it's mature on day 95. Wait for day 100 and you've lost half of your crop. Okay, you need to be in there on the, on the maturity date. And this is what happens when you plan a winter garden. Plant all of your seedlings. Literally take one weekend, plant all of your seedlings. When they're ready to plant out, plant them into the garden. As the garden starts opening up, start planting. Okay. With, um, so that was cabbage, for example. So you've got four months worth of cabbage. Nobody wants to eat cabbage only for four months. Am I right? Okay. It gets a bit much. It does. It does. I mean, you can have coleslaw. You can have coleslaw. You can have cooked cabbage. You can have um, stir fry, coleslaw. Sorry? Wraps. wraps, cabbage wraps. Yeah, so look, you can do a lot with cabbage, but you can only do so much. <laughs> okay, so what else do you do? So, Swiss chard. What South Africans call spinach. Okay, Swiss chard and spinach are two different things. The stuff that, and I'm, I'm so glad to see now you walk into pick and pay, and it's no longer called spinach, it's called Swiss chard, because it is Swiss chard. Okay, it is not, it might taste like spinach, but so does maroc, and maroc is not spinach. Okay, um, if you plant Swiss chard, if you plant Swiss chard now, it really enjoys a cool season. Who's had a Swiss chard plant that's over a year old? Plenty people, plenty. There's a Swiss chard plant in one of our um, keyhole beds. I don't know if it's still there, but it was two years old. The stem of the Swiss chard plant from the ground is about this tall. It's a well-grown plant. Okay, but if you plant it properly, if you plant enough of them, and it's, it's always the case of you have 10 Swiss chard plants, and you go, you pick off the 10 plants, and you wonder, is it enough for a family of four? <laughs> yes? No, absolutely. Cool. The next thing is root crops. Okay, you want to plant root crops, and winter is the root crop season. If you want carrots, plant them in winter. You plant carrots, so you'll plant carrots from around the end of, mid to the end of February, you start planting carrots. You plant those carrots, and if you plant enough carrots, you will not have to buy carrots until spring. Because those carrots hold in the soil. It's one of the best things about about planting carrots, we will plant, we'll plant enough carrots to feed all of our staff. And we will have carrots the whole of winter. And 
when are carrots the sweetest? Sorry? In cold weather. The minute a carrot plant experiences frost, its brick, bricks index climbs. It's sweeter after frost. Okay. Yes, sir. You can plant carrots between tomatoes. If you're planting summer carrots, don't plant the long carrots. Plant the little thumbelina, the little, um, the short carrots. Those are quick growing carrots and they'll grow really well in summer. But carrots are a winter crop. Tomatoes don't grow in winter. No, because my tomatoes are still growing, but then I can start planting the carrots now. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, 100%. So, what, what the gentleman is saying is his, his tomato plants are growing. So, in the interbed yeah, space, he can, he, he, can, he can put carrots down in the interbed space. And that's absolutely perfect. Okay. But those carrots will hold. There's no reason... And I see people lifting their carrots in the middle of winter. They lift their whole bed of carrots. And now they're processing the carrots. Don't do that. Lift the carrots in spring and process them for the rest of summer. Otherwise, you pull the carrots out of the ground in winter, and they will be the best carrots that you've ever eaten. Who grows carrots that look like this? <laughs> huh? Why? Sorry? Transplanting is one, but it's not the only reason. Sorry? Not the hard soil. You're very close. Sorry? J rooting. Yes. So transplanting. So when you transplant a carrot, it gets J rooted. You can't transplant a carrot with the root straight. It always gets bent like this. But that's, J-rooting doesn't give you the carrots that look like this. Okay? Who puts manure down with their carrots? Do your carrots look like this? Don't, don't use manure with your carrots. Manure, it, it stimulates the production of roots. Okay? And you don't want to overstimulate a root crop to produce roots. Because then it's going to look like it came out of a science experiment. <laughs> okay, we, this area is called clip view. One thing that clip view has is a lot of clip. <laughs> we grow carrots that are straight. In the soil that has a lot of clip. Because we don't put manure with our carrots. Okay, so if you're planting carrots, if you've put manure down... In your vegetable garden make sure that you put a hungry crop into that manure before you put carrots in what is a hungry crop pumpkins squash watermelon anything that produces big fruit okay they will help to reduce the fertility that's in that soil for when you for when you want to plant your carrots cool who plants carrots and when you pull them up you who plants carrots and when you pull one carrot up you get 15 how do you stop that thin them out is one way you can mix them with flour or sand I don't like flour um, because it's too fine okay what I like to do is I like to take the, the, the I like to take the seed packet so, if you imagine this is the seed packet. If you imagine this is the seed packet, and you make a little V like this, and you just tap it. What happens is the seeds line up in a line, and they go down, and you just tap the seeds like this. My wife doesn't like to do it like that. What she likes to do is she likes to mix radish and carrot seed together. So, she mixes... Um, two parts radish seed to one part carrot seed and she she plants it in a line the nice thing is that the radish seed comes up in four days so you can see where you planted your carrots okay because that's always the problem okay so the radish seed comes up you can see where you planted the carrots and then you pick the radish and as you pick the radish it thins the carrots out because they inter they're interspersed it's probably her way is smart. <laughs> Don't tell her I said that. Cool. So, uh, uh, winter soil improvement is also a time 
or, or winter time is also a time to improve your summer soil. Where is that noise? Is it someone's car going off? Yeah. Clearly. Okay. So, your, your winter garden, most people don't plant a winter garden that's the same size as their summer garden. The beds that you, that you um, are planting, that you are not planting in over winter, what you want to do is you want to plant something in those beds. Okay? And the reason for this is... Plants provide a protective cover on your soil. If there's no soil, if there's no covering to your soil, what happens is the soil biology actually dies. And what happens is the biology decreases over winter, okay, because there's nothing feeding the soil. And I'll explain how the feeding the soil works now. But what happens is that biology, it, it literally dies down to a point where it just sustains itself. And then you go, okay, fine, it's spring. I need to start planting stuff, and now I need to improve my soil, and I need to put compost, and I need to put fertilizer. And then that whole biological activity now needs to spin up, okay, to actually um, feed those plants. If you keep something growing in the soil, that biology doesn't die. Okay, so the... the, the purest form of capitalism... Didn't think this would be a, po a political um, discussion, did you? The purest form of, of capitalism is what happens between a plant and what happens to uh, between a plant and the minerals in the soil. It's the purest form of capitalism. So a plant, you have the plants growing in the soil, you have the soil, you have the fungi inside the soil, and you have the bacteria inside the soil, and you have the minerals inside the soil. So how do the minerals get to the plant? Does the plant get them? The bacteria does it. You're 100% correct. So what happens is a plant has something called exudates. Okay, the plant works out, I need um, silicon, or I need calcium, or I need sulfur, or I need some element inside the soil. What the plant does is it releases an exudate in the soil. That exudate is liquid sugar. That liquid sugar feeds the fungi. The fungi takes the sugar and the sugar says, I am, I, I am money for sulfur. The fungus goes to the bacteria and says, I've got some of this. You give me some sulfur. I'll give you some of this. And the, plant gives it, and the fungi gives it back to the plant. That whole process, it's absolutely amazing, but it works on exchange. Give me this, I'll give you that. 80% of the energy that a plant produces goes into the soil. Didn't know that. You thought that you were eating the tomatoes. 80% of the energy that a plant produces goes back into the soil. Okay, and that and and those that liquid sugar is it's in the form of carbon. So we all hear about people saying carbon capture and this and carbon exchange. If you grow plants correctly, you're putting carbon back into the soil in the form of liquid carbon. That liquid carbon feeds the fungi, the fungi feeds the bacteria, the bacteria mine whatever the fungi wants, which is whatever the plant wants. But the plant will tell the fungi and the bacteria, what it wants by the type of exudate that it puts out. If you don't have anything growing in your, in, in, in your soil over winter, okay, that entire economy collapses. Does that make sense? So the whole idea is you want to have something living on your soil at all times. So, winter soil improvement, what do you want to do? Grow something. What do you want to grow? Anything. No, seriously, you want to grow anything. So, for years, for years, I've been a, a strong believer in planting vetch as your winter green manure. And we sell inoculated vetch, so it's a vetch that's inoculated with the bacteria 
to, um, to it's a it's a it's a nitrogen fixing rhizobium bacteria that fixes nitrogen inside the soil because I don't like spending money. But you do, you have to. Okay? So if you can fix free atmospheric nitrogen into your soil via bacteria, what's not to win? Okay, it's, it's just win-win all over the place. What happens then is that the, the plant that is covering your soil, so if you go to our YouTube channel, there's a, a video called Vetch is King. Okay, and I've, I've been a strong believer in Vetch for, for many, many years because I've seen what it does to our soils over winter. It's, it's absolutely stunning. This year we are going to change it up. Okay, we are going to plant... A green manure crop of a, a, um, I'm, I'm busy designing it now, but it looks like about 12 different species of winter crops. Some are nitrogen fixing, some are not, and it's a it's a it's a it's a varied, multi-species green manure. Okay, and we did soil tests last week Friday. We will do soil tests again in spring. Okay, to see what the what the carbon increase is. But all of the investigation that I've done. Um, has led me to, uh, I'm, I believe, I'm convinced that, that we'll be doing the right thing. However, what I want you to do is plant something, plant anything, literally anything. As long as it's growing and as long as it's covering the soil, you will be improving the soil. Whether it's one species, whether it's ten species, it's entirely up to you. Okay, Vetch. For, for, a, um, for an easy win, vetch is going to be literally what you want to, what you want to plant. Okay? Those of you that are interested in the multi-species mix, have a chat to me, um, and we'll probably put it on the website in the next two weeks or so, once we've actually um, made sure everything is 100% correct. Cool, guys. What is vetch? Vetch. Um, in Afrikaans, it's called vevika. It's, um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a nitrogen fixing legume. It's a, it's, it's a stunning crop. It really, really is a stunning crop. I love it. What do you do with it once it's grown? Yeah. So what we do with it once it's grown is we actually chop it back. So what we'll do is we'll chop the plant just below the soil surface, leave the roots intact inside the soil and take the whole crop and just let it die down onto the beds. And within six weeks, it's gone. You can't see it. Like, it's literally, it's gone. It's fantastic. It's a beautiful crop. Cool. Are there any questions about winter planting? You can feed the veg to the sheep. You can feed the veg to the sheep. You can feed it to the cattle. You can feed it to the chickens. Um, veg is normally planted as a, as, a, as a winter grazing. Okay. Um, for, for, for cattle and sheep. Um, but we don't use it as a winter grazing. We use it as soil improvement. So when we get planted now? Now, yeah. And, and chopping it between so, spring? No, so what you do is you would plant it now. Um, there's about a six-week window from now to when you should stop planting if you've got frost. Yeah. If you get bad frost, we get really bad frost over here. Um, so we've got about a six week window, but if you don't get bad frost, you probably have an eight or a 10 week window. Um, what we do, so vetch self seeds very easily. And this is something that you need to actually, um, be aware of is that you don't want the pods on the vetch plant to mature. So they self seed into your soil because then you have vetch and now you've got to weed vetch. I mean, it's like, you know, who wants to weed vetch? <laughs> Nobody. And, and what we do when we plant um, our green manures, we don't, if this is a bed over here, we don't sprinkle the green manures on the bed like this. Because then you literally have to weed each plant individually. What we'll do is we'll uh, have a furrow down the center of the bed and we'll plant the vetch in that furrow. So you have a very narrow furrow where you've actually planted your plants. What happens is the vetch actually makes... Sorry, Shanae. I'm out of shot over here. The vetch actually makes like a big mat. So if it's planted in the center over here, we take that mat, we pull the mat back, and where the roots are going into the soil, we just take a spade and we cut just below the soil surface. So you leave the roots intact. 
Why do we leave the roots intact? Sorry? That's one reason, yes. The nitrogen fixing, that's another reason, yes. Soil structure, yes, but not quite. Another reason? Sorry? It creates air pockets in the soil. No, not really. Yes, but not really. Keep going. They're all good. They're all good. At the back. Green shirt at the back. So, the, the roots have exudates. No, the roots have died now. There's no more exudates. But, yeah? Allows the minerals to go back into the soil. Yes, you're missing one thing, guys. Mulch? No, you're still missing one thing. Moisture? Sorry? Okay. No, it's not too difficult. Okay. No, it's not too difficult to pull them out. Okay. So the reason why you leave the roots behind is water penetration. What happens is the roots actually die and decompose and they leave little paths deep into the soil. The minute it rains, those paths are like straws and they go and it sucks the water directly down into the soil. The next thing it does is because it's open pathways, any new plants that are planted inside there will use those pathways to send their roots even deeper. The less work the plant has to do to establish a root system, the better the plant. Cool. Didn't think about that one, did you? Okay, so, yes sir. Plant it directly where the old plants were. So if, you, if you're planting a seedling, you can plant it right next to it. You can plant it where it was. It doesn't actually matter. What you need to remember is that if you look at a tree, this tree over here, the root system of that tree is larger than the actual tree is. Okay, there is more tree underground than there is tree above ground. And that's exactly the same with the plants inside your vegetable garden. There's more vegetable under the ground than there is plant above the ground. If you, if you pull the plant out, you're pulling organic matter out of the soil. Okay, and you're collapsing that soil structure. You don't want to collapse the soil structure. Cool. Next question. Yes, sir. It's also a legume. Yeah. Okay, so the mix that we're making is going to have alfalfa and it's going to have vetch in it. So we're going to have alfalfa, vetch, mustards, kale, um, peas. Um, there's a list. It's a long list. Okay, so um, is one better than the other? No, it isn't. Um, but I think four or five are better than four or five separate plants. Four or five planted together... The sum of the whole is worth more than the sum of the individual parts, if you know what I mean. Okay, and it's exactly the same with, with, with planting um, winter cover crops and summer cover crops for that matter. We're going to be changing the whole, uh, our, our entire way that we're doing the, the whole green manure thing. And I'm a big fan of green manures. And I've been doing it wrong for so many years. Cool. Any other questions, guys? Yes, ma'am. Based on that previous comment, is it better then to cut all your plants off like just below the soil level? Very, like good que very good question. So the question is based on the previous comment about leaving the vetch roots intact. Is it better to leave the, the, the roots intact of the crops that you're pulling out to, to clear bed space? My answer is yes. For the exact same reason. Okay, the only time that you want to be lifting a crop out of the soil is if you're lifting carrots because you want to eat the carrots or lifting <laughs> potatoes because you want to eat the potatoes. Cool. In the next two weeks, I'm, I'm, I'm busy finalizing um, the seed sources because the seed source has to be correct. It's not just any old seed. So I'm busy finalizing the seed sources and I'm, 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 um, I'm, I'm doing research to make sure that what we're putting together is actually going to work together. So the vets we have for sale currently. So you can go and buy a vetch in our store right now if you want to. Okay, that's not a problem. Cool. And I think we've got black oats as well. We've got a number of clovers, um, which are all great for green manures. Excellent, guys. Yes, ma'am. Good to see you again, Ponzo.
Yes. So in the area that's the vicinity of the garlic planting, when you say uh, vetch is a winter crop, can you do vetch over the summer? Or should you no, so, so vetch is a winter crop. You don't want to be planting vetch in summer. You don't, also don't want to be planting a crop that is in competition with the garlic. Okay, garlic does not like competition. Doesn't matter if it's a vetch crop that's going to be improving your soil. The garlic's not interested in you trying to improve its soil. It's, it's interested in it providing the best uh, crop that it can. If you are um, giving the, uh, uh, the garlic competition with the vetch, the vetch will outcompete the garlic, hands down. Cool. So in the summer period, you'd plant different green manures. Okay, um, and um, I have an idea as to what I want to do. We normally use, as a summer green manure, we use something called sun hemp, which is also nitrogen fixing. Um, but we're going we're gonna to change it up as well. But that's, that's summer's problem. It's not right now's problem. <laughs> cool. Okay, guys, any questions? So why are these lying here? Why are these lying here? Yes. Okay. So it's a very good question. I mean... There's just so many things that I've, I, I, I want to talk about. So the fertilizers that you use over winter, the majority of the crops that you grow over winter are leaf crops. Lettuce, cabbage. I know broccoli is not a leaf crop, but you're actually eating the flower. Um, but the majority of the crops that you eat over winter are leaf crops. Or they are root crops. Root crops are generally grown in winter. Leaf crops are generally grown in winter. So for a, a leaf crop, you want to be feeding the leaves, which is green. Okay. For root crops, you want to feed the roots, which is a yellow fertilizer, the 232 fertilizer. If you, if you put the wrong fertilizer, so if you give the green fertilizer to carrots, what happens? You get beautiful carrots. And when you pull the carrot, you get this little thing like this. Yes? yes? Who's put LAN down on their carrots? Anybody? Nobody wants to put their hands up. Hey? <laughs> you put, if you put a high nitrogen like LAN or, or Vitagreen um, on a root crop, you are stimulating leaf growth because that is what the nitrogen does. It stimulates leaf growth. It doesn't matter whether it's an organic or whether it's a synthetic. Uh, if you stimulate the leaf growth, you will get leaves. If you stimulate the roots... So the 232, the Vita Grow, actually stimulates roots. If you feed this to your root crops, you're going to get great root crops. Okay, the, the difference as well is you don't want to over-fertilize. Even with a certified organic fertilizer like Talborn Organics, if you over-fertilize the plants, you will kill your plants. If you drink too much water, what's going to happen? You're going to die. Okay, but water's good for you. Okay, it's exactly the same with plants. If you give them too much of a good thing, they will die. Cool. What's the right volume of fertilizer to put down? Or Talborn Organics? 100 to 150 grams per running meter. <laughs> 10 out of 10. 100 to 150 grams of fertilizer per running meter or per square meter. What you can do is you can go to the Talborn stand right here on the corner, have a chat to Claire or Grant. They will give you samples of the Talborn fertilizers, okay, and run a trial with it, like literally run a trial, if you've known me for a while, you'll know that I like running trials, okay, do something, make a trial, test it, because then I can say to you, I have tried that, and these were my results, but the fact that my results were something doesn't mean it'll be the same results with you, it might be completely different. And if I say this is what you must do, you know what? Go, I don't think so. Let me try something else. And try something else. It's the only way that we learn. And we learn every single year. We will try something new and we will learn something new every single year. Okay? And what happens is we give it back to you in feedback and say this is what worked for us. Cool. Any other questions, guys? Yes, sir. Okay, so the question is, should you plant nitrogen-fixing plants throughout the year? The thing is, most plant 
plants that have the ability to fix nitrogen every single year. Okay, you plant green beans, they fix nitrogen. You plant peas, they fix nitrogen. You plant, um, who plants fenugreek? Does anybody plant fenugreek? Okay, fenugreek is a herb. Um, it's called methi. Who, who plants methi? Does anybody plant methi? Nobody. Okay, fenugreek, it's a herb. It's used as a, as a, as a spice or it's used as a, as a green. It's, it's nitrogen fixing. Um, broad beans, nitrogen fixing. So there's a lot of things that you plant that are naturally nitrogen fixing plants. The, the difference that you have is that just because you plant a bean, you go and buy a packet of beans from Living Seeds or from anybody else that doesn't sell great seeds. Um, <laughs> sure, that was nasty, hey? <laughs> if, you, if you buy a packet of bean seeds, the fact of you planting the bean seed inside the soil does not mean that it's nitrogen fixing. Why? 100% it needs the bacteria. If your soil is deficient in nitrogen fixing bacteria, the bean plant will grow, it'll produce fantastic beans, it's not going to fix nitrogen because the bacteria is not present. Okay, and the bacteria, the nitrogen fixing bacteria that works on peas doesn't work on beans as well. That very similar bacteria but you need a bacteria for peas and you need a bacteria for beans. Didn't know that, did you? Okay, so the cool thing is we actually sell the bacteria inside the shop. Comes in little vials. I think, who's bought? Like 30, 40 bucks. How much are they? Yeah, it was like 40 rand. 40 rand. Okay, for nitrogen fixing um, bacteria. It's like next to nothing. You mix it with water, you water it onto your plants, job is done. And you have, and you have to do it once. And as long as you keep your soil improved, you shouldn't have to reapply nitrogen-fixing bacteria because they will go dormant if there's no, if there's no um, bean plant there. They'll actually go dormant and wait for a bean plant. And they can wait for a couple of years. Cool. Any other questions, guys? Yes. Um, after you've put this uh, fertilizer, I know it lasts about four months. So let's say you want to go from a leafy crop to a root crop. How long after putting the fertilizer should you actually wait? Okay, uh, nothing to worry about. Okay. Nothing to worry about. Okay, so as long as you're not feeding the root crop. As long as you're not feeding the root crop um, a nitrogen fixing bacteria, it's fine. It's a case of two or three months later, it's done. Okay. The job is done. It's, it's not going gonna, it's not gonna to sit inside the soil and build up inside the soil to actually cause problems. Okay. Cool. So guys, who's planting a veggie garden this, this winter? Who's making a larger veggie garden, veggie garden than they ever did before? <laughs> so we were at Pick and Pay yesterday buying, buying the burrowvors for, for the burrowvors rolls. And we, and we know the owner quite well. And, I mean, we don't buy vegetables. I don't know why, but we don't buy vegetables. <laughs> Apparently, lettuce is like 20 or 30 bucks a head. Serious. It's ludicrous. For a lettuce. They don't last. <laughs> no. So, l let me tell you a story. That's actually very interesting that rabbits won't eat the shop bought lettuce. We, we used to have a worm farm before we um, started these worm farms over here. We had a little personal worm farm at the house. And I had big tractor tires. That was my worm farm. And we were given um, a whole lot of lettuce from a lettuce packing company in the area. And I thought, fantastic. Feed it to the worm farms. It killed the worms like this. I don't know if it was poison on the lettuce. I don't know what it was. But within 48 hours, all the worms were dead. We don't buy lettuce. Because my worms don't like lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> Say again. Cool, guys. Yeah, so um, I have a feeling just listening to people paying 30 bucks for a head of lettuce, which is it's ludicrous. 
Um, if you spend 30 bucks on a mixed packet of lettuce, you will not eat lettuce for two years. Yeah. You'll not buy lettuce for two years. Sorry. <laughs> You'll not buy lettuce for two years. If you pay 30 bucks for one packet of mixed lettuce, I think it's got three or 400 seeds in. Okay. That's one lettuce for every second day for two years. Um, and I think it's going to get worse. Okay. Um, I, I, really, I really think it's going to get worse. So I encourage you guys to plant a big vegetable garden this winter and plant stuff that, that you can use. If you're not going to eat cabbage, guys, don't plant cabbage. Okay. What I would recommend that you do because no one likes kale, am I right? I mean, you look at all of the memes and the jokes on Facebook and everyone like, like kale, nobody eats kale. If you, if you grow kale, we've had people here that have, said, that have said to me, that is kale, I will not eat it, it is disgusting. And I said to them, here's a hundred rand note if you find that this kale is disgusting. I haven't lost a hundred rand yet. Okay? The kale that you grow yourself tastes completely different to kale that you buy in the stores okay um it's it's it, it, it tastes completely different and we actually enjoy in winter we will make a green salad using kale leaves young kale leaves absolutely fantastic guys plant a big veggie garden okay you will be happy seriously you will be happy cool any other questions, guys? Yes, ma'am. Do you need to plant anything for winter pollination? So you wouldn't plant, there are no crops, um, off the top of my head, there are no crops that require winter pollination. However, um, and I'm not talking about honeybees, okay? And don't get me wrong, I, we have our own beehives, our, our own honey hives. Um, I'm, I'm a very strong believer in planting crops to feed solitary bees. South Africa has over 520 species of bee. Only one, and if you scientific, there's two, it's, it's two subspecies. It's Apis mellifera scutellata, which is the honey bee up here, and Apis mellifera capensis, which is the Cape honey bee. Okay, those are the two commercial bees. The other 519 plus species of bee are solitary bees or they in very, very small colonies like the Mapani bees and things like that. And they need food over winter. If you go and look in our show garden, have you seen the little bee hotels? Okay, go and stand in front of the bee hotels. Just go and stand in front of them and you watch the bees that are going in. And what the bees are doing is they're busy filling those holes. They fill it with pollen. And if you have a look underneath the hole, you'll see there's like a little yellow where the pollen has actually dropped off his legs or her legs as she's gone in. So what she does is she packs pollen into the hole and she lays an egg. She packs pollen and she lays another egg. She packs pollen and she lays another egg. And she fills the whole tube with pollen and eggs. Do you know what the amazing thing is? The egg that was laid last hatches first. What? The egg that lays last hatches first because the egg hatches, eats the pollen, and then flies off. The next one hatches, eats the pollen, and flies off. If the first one hatched, how's he going to get out? <laughs> hey? How amazing is that? Okay, so if you guys are planting veggies over winter, plant some flowers. Okay, the flowers look nice. You can cut them for free, put them on the, on the, um, on the dining room table. But you're also feeding the solitary bees, which are the, which are the bees that we should be looking after. Everybody goes, the honeybee, the honeybee. And yes, the honeybee. But it's the solitary bees that are also so important. Cool. Any other questions, guys? Guys, thank you very much. Thank you for coming out.